Well, good morning. We're going to start a new sermon series today on the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn uh, to Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount is contained in Matthew 5 uh, through 7. Uh, most sermon series that I do here at the church are three to four weeks. Uh, in fact, if you go visit churches or if you're from another church, you know that the pastors a lot of times do three to four week sermon series. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, number one is if you like the sermon series, it's really a great length. You can cover a topic pretty effectively in four weeks. You don't repeat a lot of material. And by the end of the sermon series, most people are like, man, I hate that that's over. But the real reason preachers preach sermon series of three to four weeks in length is in case you don't like it. You know, if you don't like it, most people can put up with anything for a couple of weeks. Or you can have an impromptu vacation or something like that. So I know what I'm about to do is really risky. We're going to spend the next two to three months walking verse by verse through uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I think you're going you're gonna to like it. Uh, we're going to just dig into the text. And if you like this type of study, it's going to be fun for you. It's been fun for me this week. And I believe we're going to have a great time. And if you don't like this type of study, well, I'll see you at Christmas. Uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work through it. But I think you're going to enjoy our time together in this series. But, because in this passage, we find some of Jesus' most familiar words. As we study, we're going to encounter the Lord's Prayer. As we study, we're going to be reminded that we shouldn't judge others unless we're willing to receive that same type of judgment. We're going to be reminded that that we should live life one day at a time, which is really all we can handle. We'll revisit the story about the man who built his house on the rock and was wise. We'll hear Jesus tell us that we should seek first the kingdom of God, and we'll engage the beautiful yet challenging Beatitudes. And there's going to be passages that we struggle with. Uh, there's a reason people don't preach through the Sermon on the Mount a lot, because there's some really hard passages in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll read things like, if your right eye sins against you, you ought to pluck it out. Or if your right hand sins against you, you ought to cut it off. We'll have to deal with the passage that says, if you marry a person who's divorced, you're committing adultery, and you cause them to be committing adultery. And we'll deal with the passage that's even harder than that that says if you even lust in your heart at all, you've already committed adultery. Uh, and then we will deal with something that's supremely difficult when Jesus says, if you have an enemy, I want you to learn to love them. I want you, I want you to, to treat them like someone that is in your love circle. Uh, it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult passage. I mean, to be honest... It is this beautiful mixture of, of grace and hope. And at the same time, Jesus delivers gut punches to us that just seem to deflate us. And, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with this? How do you make sense of that weird combination? Is the sermon intended to show you how to live and love? Or did Jesus intend to show you how far short you fall of how you're supposed to live and love. Uh, are these words of Jesus a, a utopian ideal that's impossible to keep, or are they intended to develop Christian values and, and virtues in you by guiding your steps now? I think the answer is, is this law for the Christian, or is this kind of an exposing of our sinfulness? I think the answer to that is yes. Everywhere we look in this passage, we're going to be challenged that we fall short of this. And so I, I want to warn you, uh, as we move in, we all fall short of this ideal that Jesus sets before us. But at the same time, we can't just dismiss it and say, oh, well, we all fall short, so we don't even have to try. There is a kingdom ethic that is taught here. Uh, so we're going to look at how the sermon points to our need for God's provision and how it directs us to live in a way that's good for us. But before we do, let me give you some sermon facts. The first one I'll share with you is this. This is the first of five sermons in Matthew. Matthew's structured around five sermons, five discourses, uh, and each of them are fairly lengthy. The one that we're going to look at, the Sermon on the Mount, 
is uh, three full chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, there is some debate about if the Sermon on the Mount was kind of like dictation, Matthew took it word for word, or if it was over a three-day period that Matthew kind of took the highlights of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and wrote them down. I'm not debating that these words were spoken by Jesus. I absolutely 100% believe that these words were shared by Jesus, but we don't know, uh, is it a summary of his teachings or is it an exact representation of his teaching? But one of the things we are going to see is his teaching is found in other, other contexts in the Gospels. If you go to Luke, you're going to see the Sermon on the Plain, which is a lot like the Sermon on the Mount. If you look at Mark, you're going to see many of these ethical teachings. Uh, throughout the Gospels, you see uh, this, uh, uh, this teaching of Jesus, and this really troubles people sometimes. Like, wait a minute, Mark just copied from Matthew, or Matthew copied from Mark. And I would tell you, that's crazy. Maybe they used one another, but don't be shook by that. Jesus preached these words everywhere he went. He traveled from place to place to place to place. Of course he repeated themes that there is a God in heaven. And that God's not a distant God, but he's like a father. And that father God in heaven has a kingdom. And that kingdom is different. And the people who live in that kingdom are different people. And he exposed that religion on the outside, which was all they were familiar with, fell far short of what God required for men. And God looked at the heart, and that's what God considered clean. Now, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to find three types of materials. We're going to find what we look at today, the Beatitudes, and, and these are called this for a very specific reason that I'll share with you in a minute. But these are basically statements of, here's how you can live life in a way that is beneficial to you, good to you. There's going to be places in the Sermon on the Mount where we get this same experience without... Uh, the, the familiar construct of the Beatitudes. We're also going to find some ethical commands where Jesus says, do this, don't do that. Uh, we're we're going to find that a few times in the, the Gospel of, of Matthew uh, here in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we're going to see one of his major elements to his teaching, that there's a contrast between the prevailing traditions and what Jesus was showing. This is what is really the truth. You've heard that it was said, but I'm telling you, this is the way uh, God really sees this situation. Now, while we are going to find some of these ethical commands, I want you to understand Jesus is not just giving a series of do's and don'ts so you'll act differently. He is more concerned with your character. Performance is not his goal. His goal is your, your, your heart development and, and your, your character development. So let's look at the context of this. You've got to go back to Matthew chapter 4 to see the context. In verse 23, Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Now that's important. I've highlighted it because that's going to set the sta stage for 5 through 7. Uh, here, Jesus has been going from place to place all over Galilee. He's teaching. And then in Matthew 5 through 7, Matthew says, here's what Jesus was saying when he was teaching. And that in, uh, uh, kind of unfolds in the Sermon on the Mount. He was healing diseases and sicknesses. And because of this, the news about him spread. I mean, you can imagine. It spread throughout Syria. Uh, and, and, and it's obviously been in Galilee. So they bring into Jesus all those who are afflicted and suffering, who have pain, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, the, the paralytics, and he healed them. Uh, what a gracious Savior we have. And because of this, a large crowd started to follow. Uh, from, not only from Galilee, but also from the Roman center of the Decapolis, from the religious center in Jerusalem, uh, going beyond that uh, locale to Judea, and then even beyond the Jordan. People were paying attention to Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus starts to teach people in his ministry if you're going to follow me and you're going to be a part of my kingdom, here's what people in my kingdom look like. Here's what it looks like to walk in my kingdom, uh, to live in my kingdom, to be a part of God's kingdom. So he goes up onto a mountain to pray, Matthew 5, 1. Uh, the traditional side of this is on the northeast shore of Galilee. 
Uh, those who go on trips to Israel, if you ever go with me in the future to Israel, we will visit this spot, which is the traditional site of the Beatitudes. But it really didn't become the traditional site until about 400 A.D. The reality is we don't know where the Sermon on the Mount took place. Uh, it could have been in many locations because it's just a very generic term that he goes up into the mountain. And there's just some common sense to going up to a mountain. Often when you're in the mountain plains in uh, the, the Galilean area, you kind of create some amphitheaters between these hills and you could gather a large crowd and a person without a PA system could speak and be heard by lots of people. And so Jesus probably taught in these type of locations regularly. And this time when he teaches, he sees the crowds and he goes up on the mountain and he sits down, taking the seat that was normal for a teacher of that day to sit and to say, I have the authority to teach you. And he begins to teach his disciples who come to him. But don't miss what Matthew's saying. Yes, this is for his disciples because they're going to have to make disciples and tell people about what the kingdom's like. But it's also for the crowds to hear and it's for us to hear. And so he begins to teach them. Uh, when he begins the Sermon on the Mount, he starts with something that we call the Beatitudes. Now, they're not called the Beatitudes because it's the beautiful attitude, which actually it is the beautiful attitude, but it's called uh, the Beatitude uh, because there are nine statements that all begin with the same construction. In the Latin Vulgate, uh, they begin with the word Beatitudo, which kind of blessed are. The Greek word for that uh, is the word uh, makarioi. Uh, or makarioi, however you want to pronounce that. It's a Greek word. They don't speak Greek. We all make it up when we say it, okay? <laughs> but you know if you're making something up, you just have to say it with confidence. You never admit that you don't know. But anyhow, uh, and everybody else is wrong. But uh, <laughs> the, the makarioi are those who are or will be happy, those who are or will be fortunate, and those who have done something or are in a position that they should be congratulated. We have translated that with blessed are. These are the people who are blessed. These are the people who should be happy. And so when Jesus uses this, he's implying that a person is favored by God if they do certain things, and because of this, they've got a better life. Here's how you have a better life if you have these things going on. But here's where it gets sticky. What Jesus says is better life is what most of us would describe as bad life. It's, it's countercultural. It's not what you're hearing in the news. It's not what you're experiencing in the classroom. It's not what you're going to learn uh, uh, reading on the Internet. Uh, our culture tells us that if you're going to be happy, you've got to get and experience and impress. The American Beatitudes would say, blessed is the man who's always right. Blessed is the man who's strong. Blessed is the man who rules. Blessed is the one who's satisfied with himself. Blessed is the rich. Blessed is the popular. And Jesus says, blessed is the one who gives away. Blessed is the one who waits. Blessed is the humble. And his teachings are not only against what's out there. Let's be honest. His teachings are against what's in here. It's counterintuitive as well. If I were to ask you what things need to happen in your life for you to be blessed today, what has to happen in your life for you to be blessed? You'd probably talk about some external blessing. Man, if I could get this new job, or if we could get a, a, a new house, or if we could get a, 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 a new, uh, 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 live in a new city, or we could, you know, it, whatever. That's how we would normally say. Or, or we would talk about maybe a new relationship. Man, if my kids would just behave. Or my spouse would just, you know, get along, with, make life easier. Or if my parents would get off my back. Or that's how we would say, man, if I had these things, then I would be, I would be blessed. Um, Maybe if we just didn't have any needs, if we were just completely filled. Man, if I just had my food and a place to stay and plenty to eat. But Jesus' Beatitudes that we're going to look at today invert everything human reason thinks is right and sensible and says there's a better way. Here's what Jesus is going to tell us today. 
Blessed are you when you mourn. Blessed are you when you are humble. Blessed are you when you're poor. Blessed are you when you're hungry and thirsty. None of us ever, th ever think those things. We always think that the, those are our problems. I'm poor. I'm hungry. I, I'm, I, I'm, I, nobody notices me. That's what we think are our problems, and therefore we mourn. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's the gateway. That, that's going to be an open door to your blessing, to your happiness. But not an open door like you hear from the prosperity preachers who say, God, you go through there, and then God's going to give you so much. No, 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 Jesus says, I'm going to give you something different, but it's not going to be here. It's going to be in my eternal kingdom. And every fiber of your natural being is going to re resist what Jesus says. And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, I promise you, you're not going to like all of it. I promise you, you won't. And it'll take faith to listen to Jesus' words. But Jesus will show us a better way. And he says, if you follow me, you will find that happy, fortunate, to be congratulated state. Because God has done a work in you. So let's, do, let, let's dig into the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are nine statements that begin the Sermon on the Mount. We're not going to look at all nine of them today. We're going to deal with four of them today and five of them next week. The four that we deal with today, I lump them together because I believe they deal with internal work. We kind of have to deal with the heart work before we can deal with those things that uh, are caused by other people. The last five Beatitudes seem to be dealing with your relationship to others. But let's do the heart work today. And Jesus goes right at the heart when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, we don't equate poor and happy very often, but Jesus says this is the pathway. And he's not advocating for physical poverty. Jesus is not saying we have to abandon all worldly possessions, even though he did tell some to. He doesn't say that we have to quit eating out and uh, uh, enjoying our electronic devices. He's not saying we can only dress in black and quit driving cars or take a vow of poverty. In fact, later on in the sermon, he's going to say, you need to use your wealth to help others. So what is Jesus teaching? What, what is Jesus saying? I think to help us understand this, we need to say, uh, think about two New Testament words used for po poverty. One is Pentecost, which uh, is barely getting by. Uh, the widow who put her two mites into the offering, Jesus said she was Pentecost, she was poor. But then there's tokos, which is absolute poverty, which is something that would be used to beggars and those who had nothing. And that's the word that Jesus used here. Those who are in desperate need and those who are like a beggar. And Jesus said, you really want blessedness in your life? You got to come to the point that you realize that that's all you are is a beggar. You see, most of us don't want to think that at all. We like to think we're in control. We like to think that we are intelligent people. We like to think that we're maybe ahead of others because of where we were born and what we have and what we know and what we've done. And we want to think we're, we're not poor in spirit. We're not lacking anything. And Jesus says, if you really want to have blessedness, you've got to get to the point where you realize you're dead broke. What you have is only the gift of God, and you're not better than anyone else. And he's going to illustrate this over and over in the New Testament, that you are not better than anyone. There's not one person on this planet that you are better than. All of you are created in the image of God, and all of you are valued by God. All of you are. And you have to have that posture before you can be blessed by God. Oh, but so many of us, you know, we're standing on third base when we were born and we think we hit a triple, you know. But God put us in such positions that we are blessed and we think, look what we've done. You've got to get there in your spirit that, no, 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 without God, I'm nothing. And you also have to realize that you are not good enough on your own to obtain God's favor. In the 12-step program uh, that helps people overcome addictions, the first step is admitting you have a problem. And a lot of people think that this was the creation of Bill Wilson in the 1920s who founded AA. No, it was Jesus who said, if you want to be blessed, the first step is realizing you're dead broke. You don't have it together. You are not able in your own person to lift yourself up. 
Many religions teach personal effort and achievement is what save man, saves a man. Jesus dispels that myth here. He says the first step to being happy, the first step to being saved, is admitting you're a sinner and admitting that you have a problem. God wants you to get to the place where you cry out, God, I need your help. God, I need your help. God, I need you. I'm desperate for you. And when you get there, the kingdom of heaven starts to open up. That, that's, that's when the kingdom of heaven starts. Every person who's experienced salvation has gotten here. If you haven't gotten here where you're dead broke and you know you're poor in spirit, you're not saved. If you think you've earned any of God's favor, you're not a child of God. If you think you're better than other people, you, you, you missed it. Blessed, though, happy to be congratulated to those who get to the place where they recognize, man, I don't have it together. I, it, it's not of me. It, it's of God. So kingdom characteristic number one, the children of God, the people of God, recognize spiritual bankruptcy without God. Beatitude number two. Blessed are those who mourn. This is a tough one for most of us because we're uncomfortable with grief. Young boys are taught real men don't cry. We go to funeral homes and how many of us really know what to say or do? I mean, I've been a pastor now for 30 years and I still struggle sometimes. Okay, what am I supposed to say here? What am I supposed to do? Uh, think about how far people go from, to keep from being sad medicines and self-help books and support groups and i get it conventional wisdom says if you're going to be happy then you got to insulate yourself from anything that causes you grief but jesus says pure joy pure joy is not found in an escape from grief pure joy is found through grief when you get to a place where you recognize that there is that there is a comfort that exists with you no matter what you face but what grief is he talking about? Is he talking about all sadness? You know, you're going to get joy if you're just sad and you'll have joy, you know. Uh, is he talking about grief over a lost job? That's not what he's talking about. Is he talking about disappointment of a lost boyfriend or girlfriend? That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about like the utter despair that you have because you were born in Louisville and root for the Cardinals. He's not talking about that type of despair. He's... He, He's talking about, and he's not even talking about mourning over death. He's talking about grief over sin. You see, sin is an affront to God and leaves carnage in its path. And no matter how we try, we just can't quit doing swan dives into the cesspool that is sin. And we keep diving into that sewer even though we know it's harmful for us and we know we shouldn't. And because of this, we have this conflict inside of us. You see, every person in this room, believer or not believer, every person in this room thinks that there's right and wrong. Every one of us do. And we all have this standard of morality that's not even given through laws in a book. It's given through laws written on our heart. And every person rebels against that. What is it? Every person in here, we know we shouldn't steal, but yet there's something about it. We know we shouldn't gossip, but yet we kind of, we know we shouldn't lie, but boy, to get out of a mess, we know that we shouldn't lust, but we do. Every one of us, we have that in spades. All of us. And when we sin, there's this internal conflict in us, and there's two paths. You can go the denial path. Oh, that's not really there, even though you go home and you still have guilt. I'd like to ask those of you who do not believe, how do you deal with your guilt? I've never met people who don't have guilt. But how do you deal with it if you don't believe? It's still there when you're all alone and you're by yourself. You know you fall short of who you should be. The other way to deal with it is to mourn over it. He said, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm like this. I hate that I'm like this. And Jesus says, those who get to the place who mourn over their sin, they're blessed. And those people who mourn over their sin, they'll be the ones that are comforted. They will be the ones who find forgiveness. I'm a political junkie. I don't bring politics in the pulpit. I think that's wrong. I just don't do it. I mean, I'll deal with issues. I mean, 
There are issues that I'm glad to tell you what I believe the Bible says. I just don't bring politics in the pulpit. I'll talk about how we should treat each other with grace and love each other even when we're different. But I just, but I love politics. I hate to admit that. But I do. I mean, I, when I was like 15 years old, I was like Alex P. Keaton. If for those of you who are old enough, he's like, yeah, y'all college students are looking at me like, who in the world is he? I get it. I'm old. It's all right. He, he was like this 15-year-old who would carry a briefcase and, instead, you know, he just would keep up with all the political things in the world. I kept up with that stuff. And in the early 1980s, Congress did something that was unheard of back then. They censured two people. Uh, it's the strongest thing you can do uh, besides impeachment to condemn the ethical actions of the membership. And there were two members in Congress of different parties who were censured by the, by the, uh, by the House of Representatives. One was named Daniel Crane, and the other's name was Gerald Studs. Crane's censure was for having sex with a 17-year-old female intern. Studs was for committing the same act except with a 17-year-old male. Crane tearfully admitted that he broke the laws of God and man. He cast a vote for his own censure. He stood up and said, I believe I should be censured. And when the verdict was read to him, he approached and listened and faced the verdict. Studs, on the other hand, gave a speech where he adamantly uh, uh, defended his relationship as mutual and voluntary, and he said it didn't warrant the attention of the action of the House, and he merely voted present, and when his censure was read, he turned around in disgust as his censure was read. Thomas Rosner of the Chicago Sun-Times said, being censured is the only thing that Crane and Studs have in common. He commented and said, there's one consolation for Crane. His actions teach us that there's one thing worse than sin, and that is denial of sin, which makes forgiveness impossible. Jesus is teaching us when you admit you're a sinner and you mourn over your sin to the point of repentance, the Bible says you'll be comforted. John expands on this in 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, to cleanse us of our sins and from all unrighteousness. I hope that you hear what the Bible is saying here. You cannot sin in a way. Neither one of these two men sinned in a way that they could not be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven by God. All grief over sin can be comforted. Every person who comes to him can be cleansed because of what Christ did on the cross because of his blood that was shed. We can be forgiven. And if you don't know how to deal with your guilt, may I tell you that you can receive forgiveness of sin and the alleviation of guilt from your life because Christ will be the one who takes the condemnation. He will be the one who carries your weight. He will be the one who can release you from your guilt. And he's the only one. So I encourage you, to mourn over your sin, and you'll be comforted. And the kingdom characteristic is the people in the kingdom comprehend how bad their sin really is, and they grieve over it. He goes on to say, Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. If you memorized the Beatitudes, you didn't memorize it this way. You would expect the verse to say, blessed are the meek, right? The ESV says that as well. Blessed are the meek. Translations are all over the map, and the reason they're all over the map is this word's really hard for us to translate because in English, we hear meekness, and we kind of think weakness and soft, but meekness is not a synonym for weakness. It doesn't mean spineless or cowardly, in fact, the strongest characters in the Bible are described as humble and meek. Moses, uh, one of the translations says, was a very meek man. Here it says he's a, a humble man. Even Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. The New Testament word here used for Jesus in this situation and by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is the word praeus. Uh, and it's translated either gentle or meek or humble. 
And we really don't have a word to encompass all that it entails. So there's three ways that it's used in the New Testament. One, it's used in regard to the wind. A meek wind would be a gentle wind that blows. Uh, the other is in regard to wild animals. Uh, a wild animal would be turned timid or tamed by uh, if it were considered meek. Uh, and the other would be medicine. Uh, medicine would be uh, used in a, a proper dosage would be considered soothing. But all three of those things have something in common. If they're used improperly, they're damaging. A wind can become so ferocious that it's like a hurricane. A wild animal could do major harm to you if you didn't know what you were doing. Uh, a medicine that's taken in the wrong dosage can kill you. Uh, meekness is power, but it's bridled by gentleness. If you're meek, you have the juice. You just don't have to spill it all out. And the meek will inherit the earth. I'll be honest, I, of everything in my study this week, this is the one I really don't know what Jesus is talking about. I, I really don't know. Uh, some people would say that inherit the earth means that if you're meek, God will elevate you in this life. You know, if you're meek, you just kind of stay in the background and do your thing, that God will elevate you in this life. I, I think sometimes that's true, but I'm not sure it always happens. I think some people stay in the background and die in the background. Um, some people say inherit the earth is talking about the new heaven and the new earth, and the meek will inherit the new heaven and the new earth, and that's possible as, as well. But either way, this is so far from what we normally think. Here's what we normally think. Man, I'm trying to get into this school. I've got a laundry list, all of my accomplishments. I'm trying to get this church. I need to put down all of my resume. I've got, I'm trying to get this job. I got to make sure everybody sees the real me and the great me. I'm going out on this date. I'm going to put on the good perfume and the, or the good cologne and the good outfits. You know, I want to make sure that people get the best me they can possibly get because we want to push ourselves forward. And I get it in this life. We're dealing with people who think like the world. I get it. But Jesus says when it comes to spiritual things, Pushing yourself forward doesn't do any good. Promoting yourself doesn't pull it off. It's the meek that will inherit the earth. The kingdom is not made up of chest thumpers, but of the meek. And I pray that those of us who are kingdom people would be that type of person. To understand that our strength is only from God. And be humble. And then finally today, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, hungry can mean a lot of different things. It can mean desire. I'm hungry for a certain type of food. You go to a restaurant, look at a menu, menu uh, uh, a husband looks over his wife and says, hey, what are you hungry for? What do you want? You can use hungry that way for want. Uh, it can be used for determination. You know, a team that's on a losing streak, the commentators say, man, they're hungry for a win. They're determined. they got to get a win. But that's not how it's used here. I, and I don't want you to mistake that. This is not about desire. This is not about determination. It's about desperation. Where you're so desperate that you'll eat anything. Where you're so thirsty that you'll drink whatever. This is the way Jesus is using the phrase. When Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's not saying, oh, I think a few Christian things would be nice. You know, I can add a little pie to my plate. I got a desire for that. No, 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 no. He's saying that you get to a place where you can't make it if God doesn't give you righteousness. If God doesn't do something in your life, then you will continue to be unsatisfied. And he says this, this hunger and this thirst, is for the things of God. Some argue that the righteousness that he's talking about is the imputed righteousness of God, where God justifies you before God, and that's what I hunger for, to stand right before God. I, I think that could be absolutely true. Others argue that he's talking about personal righteousness and justice to be done in our world. And I think that can be true, too, that we want what God wants, and we want to be what God has called us to be, and we want to experience what God wants us to experience. But those who yearn for God above all are the ones he says will be filled. 
And I want to do an experiment before we, before we close up today. How many of you know people who are completely satisfied? I mean, 100% satisfied. Man, I could count those people like on one hand in my life who I know are, com they're satisfied with their job, they're satisfied in their church, they're satisfied with their kids, they're satisfied with their family, they're satisfied with, how many people do you know who are truly satisfied? And yet everybody's hungry. We live in a society that's starving and yet they're never and, and they constantly indulge. Two things have been said to characterize our affluent society. Our self-indulgence and our lack of contentment. Football season started yesterday. It was like Christmas at my house. Oh, man. Awesome. That's strange for a Kentucky fan to say, but it was good. Feels good. Uh, but uh, next week, the NFL starts, and who cares? But anyhow... Uh, <laughs> Tom Brady, the most hated man in America, I believe. Um, and it, it's strange, too. I mean, like, maybe 10% of the people in the United States love Tom Brady. Maybe. Uh, probably more like 10 people. But then the rest of the people in the world just seem to hate him. And Tom Brady, if you don't know who he is, he was the quarterback for the New England Patriots, and now he quarterbacks for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I think he's still with them. Is that right? Still with them this year? Oh, he's won, what, six Super Bowls now? Seven? I think it's six. Maybe it's seven. But he's won a bunch. He can fill a hand and some. Okay? A few years ago, he was interviewed on 60 Minutes uh, by a uh, Steve Croft. And despite his fame and his career accomplishments that he'd already received, listen to what Brady told Croft. He said, I feel like there's still something lacking. He said, why do I have a handful of Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? Please listen to this. Here's a guy who's at the pinnacle of human achievement. Why do I have a handful of Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, that, this is what it's all about. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be all it's cracked up to be. Croft pressed Brady. He said, well, what's the right answer? And Brady added, what's the answer? I wish I knew. I love playing football. I love being quarterback for this team. And at the same time, I think there are a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find out. I feel like I'm missing something. Guys, that's everybody on this planet without Christ. 1 John 2.15 says, Don't love the things of this world or, uh, or the world. If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. And this is where in a revival sermon, the guy gets up and kind of stomps and spits a little bit and says, give up the drinking and give up the girl chasing. And, and that's the way it's supposed to go. Well, I encourage you to not drink and I encourage you to, to, to not chase uh, bad girls anyway. <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right? <laughs> But it's not talking about just the things of this world. He's talking about what you love. Do you love God? And then he says in verse 16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of your possessions, it's not from God, it's from the world. And then listen to what he says in verse 17. And the world and its lust is passing away. Can you hear it? I mean, it's almost mic drop. We're living and chasing and wanting and promoting and, and, and yearning for stuff and experience and ease and comfort. And we think we'll find it in relationship or we think we'll find it in positions or we think we'll find it in the next job or we think we'll find it in our education. And all of these things are passing away. All of them. And you're going to find yourself starving even though you should be stuffed. Because you've consumed all your life and you don't have the answer. And Jesus says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you'll be filled. 
Later, Jesus would say, I'm the bread of life. Hungry soul, come and eat. I'm the living water. Unquenched soul, come and drink. I am the one who will give you comfort and I will give you rest. Kingdom characteristic number four. Kingdom people realize that only God satisfies and therefore they choose to desperately seek him. Let me give you some takeaways. Here's what I want you to take home. First of all, if you don't know if you have a relationship with Christ, if you don't know if you have a relationship with Christ, I pray today you'll talk to somebody. We want to talk to you about what we did with that poverty of spirit, what we did with that mourning over sin, what happened in our life that, that, that crushed us to the place that we were humble and how God put his spirit of power within us and how we have chosen to find satisfaction in him. If you don't have that relationship today, right outside these doors to the right, there's a counseling center that we'd love to talk to you about, to, about that today. Or you can come and talk to one of us right after service. But here's what I want you to take home if you're a believer. As we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to find these teachings of Jesus are often really paradoxical. <laughs> He's going to tell us stuff that doesn't seem to make sense. And yet, 2,000 years of history that have proven that those who go the way of the Master find satisfaction. Number two, as we deal with the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to realize that the heart is the true battleground of humanity. And then here's what I want you to hear, because I don't want you to mistake what was taught today and what's going to be taught in the future as the pathway to blessing. All of the directives of Jesus are going to seem impossible. That's because they are. Without Christ, we cannot achieve what God has called us to. It's not a works-based faith that Jesus was laying out. It was a come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the time to preach your word today. I thank you for the chance to gather and proclaim that we believe in Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. And we believe that through his sacrificial death, Lord, that he can take our poverty of spirit and our mourning, and he can give us meekness and hunger and thirst for righteousness. But God, we know that's not possible without Jesus working in our life. And so God, we give you thanks for what you have done in us for opening our eyes to see the truth that there is a way that leads to death, that there is a way that leads to life, and that is through the cross of Jesus. God, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to your people, help us to be kingdom citizens through the power of the Spirit that you've given us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.